Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Success Spotlight. Today we are here with um, Chris Howden. He is a CBC radio broadcaster. Um, he is a broadcasting and journalism graduate from Ry Ryerson University, and he's been a producer and a writer with CBC Radio since 2003. Um, and so we are super excited to talk with Chris today, um, hear his experience, and uh, ask some questions. So I'm going to be monitoring the chat. Um, so if you do have any questions during Chris's um, discussion with us today, please feel free to write it into the chat um, and I will uh, pass those along to Chris. We'll also have a question period at the end of the uh, presentation as well. Um, and so we're going to get started. So I'm going to pass it over to Chris and uh, welcome. Chris, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here, everybody. This uh, is weird for me. I apparently have to wear these to hear you and to not feedback as this is actually the studio where I do the show now because I'm separated from my co-host who is in another studio. She gets the nice one. Um, but as you can see, I have the schematics for every studio in this vicinity. I don't know how to read any of them, but I feel like it gives me a kind of power. Um, so yeah, Vicky's right. I have been on at CBC for like 18 years. And I think I started at at, uh, as it happens about 17 years ago. So I am going to try to expand that experience. But the fact is, I've had one workplace for like a ridiculously long time. And I kind of got lucky uh, to get this job in the first place. Um, I'm a little distracted by the uh, fantastic subtitles that are coming up as I speak. And they how they fix themselves as I no. Okay. I'll stop looking at that. Um, all right. So I am from originally Niagara on the Lake. Um, just going to let my dad in here. Hi dad. Um, which, uh, you probably all know where that is, um, where I attended two schools that are not there anymore. Uh, I didn't have any role in that. Uh, then I went to U of T for English and theater. Um, I was mediocre at both. Uh, so when I, finished that degree, I uh, decided to take some time off, which was bartending, also in Niagara on the Lake, for a couple of years. And it stretched and stretched. And I was surrounded by fellow bartenders from different bars, who I noticed already were older than me and B, all had degrees that they were, they were going to get back into it. Eventually, um, it made me realize over time that they they weren't getting back into it. And so I was starting to panic when my friend Dave contacted me to say he was going to go to Ryerson for radio and television. So I, I mean, really, if he had called to say he was going to take a course in uh, constructing porta potties, I would have probably leaped at the opportunity just to get out of that job. However, I was, I was excited about it because I grew up listening to radio of all kinds um, but in particular CBC. So I thought, oh, maybe I can get a job at CBC out of this degree. Um, the degree itself, anyone from Ryerson here was, um, like a little, it was fine. It was fine. It did not focus on radio. Most people in that program wanted to be, uh, on TV and sportscasters for the most part. Um, so it was a small cohort that was in radio, but that piece of paper was enough to get me in this building. I applied for a job doing just grunt work, which was watching archival footage, old CBC shows to put into a show that was about the 50th anniversary of CBC television, which meant watching hours and hours of like beachcombers and, uh, the friendly giant and Mr. Dress up. That part was nice. Uh, beachcombers is terrible. Anyway, um, and then about a year after, when that was finished, they needed a body, essentially, to sit in a chair uh, at a show that was about to go off the air. Um, it was called This Morning in the CBC tradition of naming programs for the exact time that they're on. Um, and so I mostly just answered emails and ordered office supplies and stuff. 
And then at one point, I, they had nothing to lose. They were like, well, if you want to produce, why don't you pitch some stories and we'll see if you can get them on the air. So I think the first interview that I pitched was this singer songwriter, Ron Sexsmith, who's from St. Catharines, who's uh, been fairly successful. And um, so I was super excited. I got him. I wrote the questions, which is what a producer does. I, um, and then I sat in on the recording and then, so we had about 20 minutes of, of Ron Sexsmith and, uh, and then they were like, okay, well, so now you take it and edit it. Well, I don't know how it works everywhere else. Hopefully those of you who are in radio, if any of you are, are learning editing software now, presumably you are. Um, I did not know how to use the editing software, which was problematic because Ron Sexsmith is a very, very good singer songwriter, uh, but a very, um, a very thoughtful, um, speaker who, uh, who, uh, who takes a lot of pauses and says, uh, uh, a lot. So I had this 20 minute interview about five minutes of which were, uh, um, which I did not know how to cut. Uh, so CBC audiences got an entire program, five minutes worth of us uncut. It was, it was a good conversation. Don't get me wrong, but it's typical CBC at the time. Anyway, was that I think it was two years later after being in radio that I got official training on how to use this software that I had long since learned how to use anyway. Um, so after I was sort of bumped around for a few years, uh, Metro Morning and another show that was going off the air, they just kept sticking me in. I was like the Grim Reaper of CBC radio shows for a while. Um, and I did not like Chase producing. We call it Chase producing. I'm sure uh, people who have any current affairs interest uh, know the term. Um, chasing, for the most part, is a, is a not... Uh, necessarily an appropriate word for it. It sounds very strenuous, but chasing consists entirely of calling someone on the phone to see if they will do your radio show. My two major uh, issues around that were I hate talking on the telephone and I really hate calling strangers. Um, that's a drawback when you're going to be a chase producer, which is how I started to think I'm not, I don't think I can be a chase producer and the worst assignment I had, and this was not f funny. Uh, it's a little absurd to think about in retrospect, what, uh, Carol Shields, the Pulitzer prize winning author was dying and someone in the building knew someone who knew her and said, uh, she's going to die tonight. And so you're going to need to get a story on the air tomorrow. So I was assigned to call two of her friends and say, I'm sorry for what is going to be your loss, but will you come on the air tomorrow morning and, and talk about her? It was, for, for me, it was excruciating for a real Chase producer, uh, which I'll talk about more, but the people that I work with who are phenomenal and almost all of whom over the 17 years here have been phenomenal, that's an opportunity. They're excited, not by anyone's imminent death, but by the idea of get, booking guests who will adequately pay tribute to that person. For me, it was just, all I could think about was, I'm so like, I dialed with trembling fingers and was like, oh, I'm so sorry. So it was not my forte. However, what was my forte sort of, or at least what I was better at was writing the scripts for the host to read before the interview. Um, that's a kind of, um, it's as skills go in the building, chase producer is valued significantly more highly than ability to write. However, that ability to write got me an interview it as it happens. Um, and the boss at the show I was working on who, who recommended me for the job here clearly thought fairly highly of my writing, which I, um, I only say because my first interview here was disastrous. I uh, had just come back from like the day before from a canoe trip where it had rained the entire, like, I don't know if you've been up north when it's rained. It's not the same rain as it is here. It was like literally just one giant bucket of water being overturned over all of us all night. My I pitched my tent in what turned out to be a creek. Uh, 
and woke up with it roaring through my sleeping bag. So I was, then we had to paddle back. It, I was exhausted. So I gave this barely coherent interview, but I guess again, and I'm uh, this humble brag, I guess, but because my boss was like, no, no, tr trust me. He knows how to write. They gave me a second chance, which was great because they gave me a job essentially doing what I had been doing at the other show, answering email, but also directing the show. Now that means on this show, uh, we have ordinarily two hosts. You can't see where I'm pointing, but there's another studio over there. They're on the other side of the glass. You point at them when they talk, you make sure the show fits into the time that you have. And it was super exciting because I got to work with Barbara Budd, who was the host at the time, and Mary Lou Finley, who was the interviewing host at the time. Um, and then gradually interviewing house, it said, uh, still watching the closed captioning. Um, over time, then at one point, the writer uh, at the time took a leave. And so they put me in the writer's chair. And um, the first time I ever hosted Barbara, who was who does did the job that I'm doing now was snowed in at her house. And uh, I remember going on the air in a state of essential i was so frightened that it was it was like i had just been in a car wreck so i kind of was doing the stuff that i was supposed to be doing reading the words off the page but uh i had no idea really where i was i remember being both really cold and that my mouth was i could not there was no saliva in here at all. It was making terrible smacking noises every time I opened my mouth, but I did it. And then a few years later, uh, a new boss was like, why don't you do a week of hosting? Um, now, I'll, I'll get to that part a little bit later on. So uh, I don't imagine there's any questions yet because I haven't said anything that would generate one, but if you have any. Um, so as it happens, has been on since 1960. Eight. And at the time, it was part of this revolution at CBC Radio. Weirdly, at least from our perspective, I think the great breakthrough of as it happens was that there were all kinds of call in shows. So somebody uh, decided to do a call out show. It, I, I imagine in the room, people's jaws dropped. I don't find it that um, maybe it's because we've been doing it for so long, it's not revolutionary anymore. But we do still do that to this day. There are every other show on radio will try to get a guest into a studio. So the line is really clean and it sounds maybe more like a normal conversation between two people in a room. We only call people on the phone. The rare occasion we'll book somebody in a studio if it's a long interview. Um, of course, even at the time that gave us access to people in situations that you ordinarily wouldn't have access to them in. And it allowed us to get people really close to stories, which is our goal on the show. We try to get what we call principals, people who are actually involved in the story that just happened or is happening. Um, with mobiles, we've been able to, of course, get people at the center of uh, demonstrations. We talked to a woman in Myanmar this week. Uh, we've talked to um, people at uh, protests in Poland in the last month. Like you just, you can get people right in the center of things. Although even in the seventies, um, they were still able to do that because people just answered the phone when you called back then there was no call display and I think um, since you didn't know who was calling you picked up so that there were situations where there was one time I think it was the 70s when there was a hostage situation at a bank in Toronto and um, they just called the bank and which led to the host at the time Barbara Frum talking to the guy who was holding the hostages who um it turned out just wanted a plane so he could fly to uganda simple request i'm making jokes because everybody was fine so we ended up not just talking to that guy um but then also talking to the police and then we eventually got we they eventually got those two to talk through the phone because we had called both sides. Um, so, you know, that, and I think at one point we got somebody on a sat phone on a submarine, like you can, you can still get, you can still get people when they were landlines uh, at the center of things. And another um, thing we used to do is if something had happened uh, 
for example, there was an IRA bombing in London, we called a pub and got the bartender to talk to us and then pass the phone around there. So it, it allows a, a real um, flexibility in terms of the guests that we can get, um, which and TV is fantastic, but in general, you need lighting, you need a setting, you need, I mean, you know, everybody who's tried to set up their Zoom background realizes oh, it kind of matters what's behind me. People can be in any situation, in any state of <laughs> undress, presumably. Once in a while, you don't hear it, of course, you just, you're hearing a good conversation. But once in a while, I think, what what is this person doing? Like when I'm on the phone, I pace you know, when I'm not on a microphone, I pace around and I stare out the window or I play video golf or something. But um, so you, something about the disembodied voices makes you not question that. There was one interview that when I was chase producing for this show, I booked an interview for Remembrance Day. They were doing an excavation in Belgium. They had found the remains of a lot of uh, allied soldiers and they were doing this excavation. It was a very sad story. Um, but at one point, about 10 minutes in, um, we had been hearing these slightly odd noises, just and, and the acoustics were a little funny. And, um, and then about 10 minutes in, the host, Mary Lou Finley, and I both heard, there's an unmistakable sound when your butt squeaks on a bathtub, and it echoes. And so at that point, we were like, He's, so we, I could talk right into her ear without him hearing. I was like, I think he's in the bathtub. She was like, yeah, I think he is. So of course it was this, it was this tremendously somber interview, but at the very end, after she said goodbye, she said, just, just one second. Can I just ask you, are you in the bathtub? <laughs> this is a little pause. And it's just like, yeah, but you know, I'm very, I've been working. I was very doing like, no, it's no problem. It's not, it's, it's fine. But um, you know, he'd been excavating his, totally legit but it's one of those rare occasions where it you are actually thought oh i think i know where that person is okay what else do i have to say oh yeah so i don't know i'll tell you about what we how the day works um right now my colleagues are all in a story meeting which i would ordinarily be in it starts at 10 30 every day so every morning uh the producers about we have about eight producers on any given day, um, get up, scour the news. Everybody has their own sites. We check all the big papers and all the big broadcasters, but we also, everybody has smaller sites that they check. Um, in my case, I usually am looking for, I'm usually pitching the weirder stories, which are kind of a hallmark of the program. So we obviously, uh, we do current affairs. So we do a lot of hard news. Um, Today, presumably, we'll be talking about the chief of defense staff stepping aside for this investigation that nobody has revealed what it's about. Um, but so there are certain stories that you know you're going to be doing, and then we have to fill the rest of the show. And and um, a, as I say, a big part of that for us is not just covering the big, serious and sad stories, but covering weird stuff that people have done or, in, you know, interesting things, because um, as important as hard news is, humans are doing all kinds of stuff all the time. So we try to cover that um, spectrum of what people do. So then as soon as the story meeting is over, which is probably about now, uh, my bosses, the um, executive and senior producers will huddle, not physically right now, and put together what we call a chase list. And then everybody starts making their calls if they haven't done that already. Uh, we book people all day. So the show sounds live, um, but we don't, it's not. Uh, I am live. So I am, you know, it's whenever it comes back to me, I, I am live. At least we do the show live. To, I do the show live to the Maritimes. But Carol's interviews, she's away today, but Carol's interviews are all pre recorded the same day. Um, once in a while, we do something live if we have to. Um, and that's, that's it. Then at, throughout the day, the producers, uh, it's a big job. So not only are you chasing, as I mentioned, you're also writing what you've booked your guests, you know what you're trying to get from that story. So you write the questions for them. This is what I'm trying. This is how I want this story to emerge. It's not just this is what we want them to tell us. But for for people to tell a story in the best possible way, 
you want it to, there are different schools of thought on this, but you kind of want it to open out and you want it to have a dramatic, uh, like a narrative arc and all that sort of stuff. So they write those questions, which Carol will use or not use depending on how the conversation goes. Once that's recorded, the chase producer goes back and edits it because they all know how to use the software, um, which is very dumb. I'm sure whatever you guys are using is significantly better than what we use here, but that's another story. Um, and then all those interviews get put in a lineup and then people file the scripts, the introduction, here's what I have to say. Um, my role is kind of just to give a short explainer of what you're, you know, ideally just set up enough of the story so that you're going to want to hear what the guest says. And then I shut up and, and Carol and the guest take over. Um, there are different schools of thought on how to write an effective introduction, but uh, you know, sometimes it takes a full minute and sometimes it's, um, you know, I, we, we've done one that was apparently, uh, I, I remember reading one where a guy got up and fought a cougar naked. And that was really all we said in the introduction on Tuesday, so-and-so fought a cougar while naked, we reached him in British Columbia or whatever, you know, sometimes that's all you need to say. Um, and then that's it. Then I go to air at five 30 in this very studio talking into this exact mic with these dumb headphones on. And, um, so that is, that's a, a day it, as it happens. I just wanted to talk a, a, a little bit about, I'm not sure if anybody here is in journalism or, um, but regardless, I think this applies to most, uh, there it's would apply to a, a lot of you in different fields that the things that you need to have to be a chase producer or a journalist at all um, are have been exemplified by almost everyone that I've worked with on this show with a very few exceptions. First, you have to know what is an interesting story. And it's not just the news. It's not just like, for example, this chief of defense staff story, which we still don't know much about. Uh, in case you haven't seen it yet, he was just um, given the job a month ago. I think he started in January. Um, he's the guy who tweeted out the the tweet saying diversity is important uh, and shared a photo of eight white guys sitting around a table. So he already got in some trouble for that. Um, but he's pledged to ch change the military, change the culture of the military. So this is maybe a little bit more significant than it would ordinarily be that, that there are unspecified allegations. He has decided to step aside. So it's pretty serious, whatever it is. So that's just news. We don't want someone to just tell us the facts of what is happening. We want to get somebody who either, you know, experienced, a, not to jump to conclusions, but a harassment complaint or somebody who has specifically lodged complaints about the culture of the military, something like that, where you're actually going to get a human story out of the news, because uh, otherwise, no one's going to keep listening. It's not interesting. And it doesn't really help you understand the story. Um, you want to be able to find a good guest. Now, a couple of weeks ago, one of the singers from the Supremes died. And um, one of my colleagues booked Martha Reeves, who is a great singer. She did uh, Martha and the Vandellas did um, dancing in the streets in the 60s. It was, you know, she was a big deal. Um, however, I don't think he was allowed to do what we call a pre-interview. You call them up, you just make sure that they can talk. Uh, you make sure that they can explain their ideas clearly, um, especially if they're in science. Sometimes scientists have a little trouble making their ideas clear to an audience of lay people, which is what most of us are. In the case of Martha Reeves, I don't think my friend John got a chance to talk to her beforehand. Because Carol's first question was something very gentle, like, I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, how are you remembering your friend today? Or something like that. And Martha Reeves said, why would you ask me something like that? I, I'm remembering her by, you know, and like was immediately indignant about this very nice question. And it kind of went like that the whole time. Uh, Carol would, you know, say something like she was a great singer. Like, yes, she was a great singer. Of course she was a great singer. So it, it was weirdly combative and we've done more than one like that. Usually we know that's gonna happen if Carol is going to talk to a minister who's maybe not told the whole truth or one time uh, Don Cherry hung up on us. One time Carol did an interview with Rob Ford that you can still find on the web. He was 
I mean, he rest in peace, but um, when he was, he was at a football practice, I don't know why he agreed to take the call in the first place, but the whole time Carol was like, you know, so what are you, this was before almost everything, but he had just been elected. She was asking him about policy. He was like, yeah, we're just gonna, we're just gonna stop the gravy chain. Jim, great job. You're doing a great job over there. Uh, anyway. So uh, yeah, I got to go. Like it was, it was, it's hilarious. Um, and bananas that he agreed to take that call. Another thing that's super important, and this is uh, just true for life, especially in an era when there are all kinds of not real media outlets trying to tell you stuff that's patently false, or QAnon is huge or whatever, critical thinking skills are really important. And I've learned a lot from working on the show. I do not have a background in journalism. I learned on the job. And I learned luckily on a show where critical thinking is super important. I remember sitting in the first meetings and, and and somebody would say, well, of course, we have to cover what's going on in Zimbabwe. And I'd be like, what the hell? What's going on in Zimbabwe? I had no idea. Uh, so over time, I learned all this stuff. But uh, one, other, one of the things I learned about critical thinking, for example, in a science story, someone would pitch a story about oh, asparagus can cure cataracts. And my boss would always say, in mice? And the producer would read through the, and go, yeah, yeah, in mice. Like, well, that's not... The story is usually torqued in such a way that it makes it seem like it's a huge breakthrough. And maybe it is, but, but, you know, be careful about what, especially in the era of COVID, there's a lot of people spreading that kind of misinformation. So you have to know how to read through a source and figure out a, whether it's legit and B, whether the person who is being quoted knows what they're talking about. Um, in one instance, early on when I was working here, uh, my friend pitched a story about a magazine called Stu, S-T-U. It was going to be a magazine for regular men because apparently this person who was starting the magazine was sick and tired of these men's health, you know, abs on the front, everybody, you know, with like fancy diets and fancy workout routines. And it seemed it was in the National Post. And so my friend was like, oh, it's a perfect as it happens story. So we called the guy up. I was sitting next to him at the time. My friend came out of the studio and was like, there's something wrong with that story. And uh, I was, I, I had heard it. I thought, I didn't, what do you mean? Like, I didn't hear anything. He's like, no, it's something that guy's, that guy's not telling the truth. Um, so he, he realized that, that while the interview was going on. So he was typing, there's a teleprompter in the studio. So he was typing to the host, ask him about his um, sponsors, ask him who's advertising in the magazine. And he, Mark came out and then he called the three, I think the guy said crest or something. And I don't know, men and speed stick or, you know, whatever, do some. So Mark came out and then methodically called each of the so-called sponsors and found that none of them was advertising in this magazine. And therefore Mark was like, this magazine doesn't exist. So we almost have never done this and we almost never have to do it. But he was like, we're going back in to the studio. We're going to call him again. And we're going to put all this stuff to him. So it turned out it was a guy named Jesse Brown, who now runs Canada Land, who was a, uh, at the time working for a Canadian magazine as a, like a media prankster, I think he called himself. So his, the, the particular thing he was trying to pull off was to plant a story in the media and then have, see how many outlets called and just reported it, you know, without really looking into it. Um, and he asked, he asked my friend, Mark, please don't air this. I have like three other interviews lined up and I'm hoping to get these people. But of course, Mark had done the exact thing that this guy believed he was not going to do, which was do the legwork. I was, it blew me away. It continues to blow me away to this day, because I promise you, I would have walked out of the studio and gone, that was pretty funny and not asked a single critical question and just put it to air and, and he would have succeeded in his goal. And there was later some trouble because Jesse Brown for a while was working here. Uh, a colleague of mine came in one day about a year after the initial interview while Jesse was working on a different show. And my, uh, my friend Mark was, we were having a meeting and another guy who works on the show was like, yeah, I was out on the weekend um at a bar and jesse brown was there and he was telling everybody that he fooled as it happens and i've never seen my friend mark so angry 
he just got up in the middle of the meeting and walked over and apparently they almost had a fist fight because Mark was like, you are lying. I, anyway, um, so Mark took that very seriously to the point where there were some goofy interviews after that that he insisted we double and triple check. Um, there was one, we talked to a Texas lawyer whose neighbor was suing him about the donkey that he had. And so this guy took his donkey, this lawyer took his donkey into court, um, mainly so he could keep saying that he had taken his ass to court. Uh, and to use the word ass, like in the interview we did with them, he talked, I just thought that maybe the judge would want to see my ass. Like he, he, every opportunity he had to say ass, meaning donkey, he did. And uh, so Carol came out of that interview. Mark was like, we got to double check that. He's like, no, I think it's, it was real, by the way. Which just to finish this subject, we, like a couple of weeks ago, Vicky was mentioning to me that somebody had asked about a, in a, like a memorable interview about two weeks ago we talked to a guy who had built a guitar a heavy metal musician who had built a guitar out of the skeleton of his dead uncle um and he put up a photo of the he sent all this stuff to a metal site called metal sucks he put up like you could you could see the whole step-by-step -step process he had the whole pelvis and backbone and the you know the, it looked like a guitar and photos of him playing it. His name is Prince Midnight. So we called him. It was a fantastic interview. Although he sounded like he was really high, which I guess is, you know, that was central casting, exactly what you'd expect. Um, and then two days later, someone was like, that's, that's, that story is not real. Now we have almost never aired a fake story, but it was so convincing. And I was, I was immediately like, that is an all time classic interview. Um, but then on the Friday, we had to call up somebody who had exposed this as a fake story and go like, so why is it not real? I was more disappointed that someone hadn't done that than that we got tricked. It was actually a very good trick. Um, so congratulations to Prince Midnight. Um, oh, yeah. And just in general, this is a good, uh, a good um, rule for being a producer or a journalist or anyone don't be a jerk we had a we I've, there have been maybe there's been maybe one jerk in the entire 17 years that i've been here uh he was the kind of jerk who would not share his contacts with you who would in fact like leave digits out of phone numbers when he filed the numbers for people to maybe use later he was an unusual case but just don't do that um i don't know if anybody has any questions at this point yeah, like we do. We do have a few about. questions. If All right. Want to move into some of those? Sure. Um, so one question came in that says, "What do you like most about your job?" Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, for years, for about ten years, I was the writer, and one of my favorite things was to write something. Radio writing is weird because it's not like prose. It's not even like writing for a newspaper. Um, it's uh, you. You you only hear what I say over the radio once you can't, I mean, you can rewind if you have a podcast, but the premise is I have to, it has to be clear to you, this whole thing, whatever I'm introducing, you can only basically the rules are like one thought per sentence. Keep it super simple because with a news article, you can reread it and go, I didn't get that at all. But with a radio interview, you have to know exactly what's about to come up because you don't get a chance to reread what what I can reread off the paper. So one of my favorite things was the writing and to write something in such a way that it was hopefully surprising that um, it's so, you know, dumb jokes or whatever. So my favorite part at that point was writing stuff for my friends, Barbara and Jeff Douglas to say, doing this actual job is really, uh, it's fun in a different way. It's super um, weird to be on the radio um, as a host of something because your goal is when I first hosted, like when my, when my, when the later on, after that first time, when I hosted the bo uh, boss I had after that said, do you, you, let's do a week. Let's see how you sound on the radio. And when you go on, just be yourself. And then I came in the next morning and she was like, okay, so don't like, don't be that self be 
and what she meant, she was very, she was much kinder than that. But basically what she meant was you have to be a radio self, as you can hear from the way that I'm talking. I don't talk always in full sentences. I say, uh, I, you know, lose my train of thought. Um, what was I just saying? No. Uh, so the idea though, is to sound conversational, but like radio conversational. I would never speak to you in the way that I speak speak in these full sentences with these clear explanations on the radio. So the idea is to sort of find some happy medium where you sound authoritative, but also human, but also like, you know, like exactly what this story is, but also like maybe you're sort of hearing about it for the, like it's, it's a lot of things to try to do at once. So the fun part of that when it works is um, when I finally stop worrying about delivery as a concept and just something comes out and I think, oh, that sounded like I wanted it to sound. Um, there's some adrenaline in it, which is fun. Um, and we get mail from people, which is fun. So there's, you know, we, we, um, I forget. Oh yeah. Carol and I have been complaining all month about saying February, which is, uh, easily the dumbest month name and the hardest one to say. Um, and then we got a letter from like an actual letter from somebody who uh, suggested, first of all, that we not only drop the br sound from February, but he wrote the entire letter using words that would have B and R in them, but taking the B and R out. Uh, so, you know, like there's, it's, it's a conversation. It's not the same as it used to be. When I started, people called in all the time. We don't get that many calls anymore, but you know, it's, it's, it's nice to be part of, uh, part of, and actually this is a separate thought, but when I grew up, this was on in our kitchen all the time, as it happens was on when we were eating. Um, so it's nice to know. It's fun to know that in some way my, I'm there in people's kitchens and cars and while they're doing the dishes and yeah, it's a little amorphous to describe the fun part, but plus I still am doing a lot of the writing. So I, I still get to twist things around you know, to ideally make them surprising. Mm -hmm. Um, Tina, do you have a question? Oh, there's a hand. Yeah. Hi, yes, I do. Hi, Chris. Thanks for joining us today. I uh, love your know. stories and love CBC Radio. I always have it on. Uh, Chris, uh, what tips would you give to our students looking to break into that business? Uh, well, I mean, it depends on, I guess, what the business is, whether it's journalism or radio. Like in radio, the, the goal, I think, certainly at CBC, and I would guess this applies everywhere, is get in the door. Like, and whether that means um, an internship or, or uh, and which even if that work is sort of seems silly at first, twice I have essentially started in the mailroom at, of different places. And in pretty short order in both cases, they'll give you another job. Now, and I have multiple, there are multiple people I could name in this building who uh, started out, you know, they, you see them as interns or they worked on our show. And then a couple of months later or six months later or whatever, you'll see them somewhere else. And they actually are working full time, whether it's temp temporary or on a contract. Um, so if be, get in there, physically get in there, don't, you know, like jump the turnstile or, or wear a disguise, but find a way to physically get in the building. Um, and secondly, I guess this is a little bit broader, but, you know, find a thing that you're really interested in about the thing that you're going to do. Um, you can't just have the ambition to do something and then, you know, sort of manipulate the situation so that you get there. If you don't have something to say once you get there. In my case, and I was lucky, I, I had no ambition to ever be the host of this show. I was happy enough to get my first job here. And every job I've had since was like, what? Um, so this part's uh, especially peculiar to me. But I, I got it because I liked writing. I got it because I liked the job. I've worked with a bunch of people who started again as interns who are still on the show, who made themselves, um, I guess I'm sort of going back to the first one, made themselves kind of indispensable. They proved that they were, um, that they had energy, that they were eager to do it and that they genuinely liked it. 
corollary to that is try not to end up in a job that you don't like. And if you have that job, um, leave it. I've been super lucky. This is uh, every part of this job has been something I've enjoyed. So um, yeah, that's sort of roundabout way of answering your question, Tina. No, thank, thank you. you. That's great. Just to kind of jump off that, what would be some of the tasks that an intern would be responsible for? Well, that's changed a lot on this show too. And I guess, I'm guessing probably as staffs shrink, which is an unfortunate, like it's a, it's a truth across media that that's happening, including private radio. Um, I mean, you know, giant corporations own so many of these things that if they, anyway, it's not to bomb everybody out, but it's been a, it's been sad to watch um, and be part of, because we've had major cuts here. So, so to that, a result of that has been that an intern who once we used to have interns who literally did whatever they wanted. And in one case, I think a very nice intern just got everybody coffee once a day and then just sort of hung out. Um, now an intern does exactly as much or as little, well, now really just as much as they want. So we, on this show, we now have people uh, learning to chase as soon as they want. Um, also, they are getting their, their editing software training like on day two, which I think is totally unfair, uh, but also very good. Um, so yeah, I mean, on this program, and I would, I would suggest probably on every program in the CBC, um, you can be working as a producer. I mean, yeah, it's intern work, but it gives you a chance to, I know this, this is, I mean, there's a difference between being taken advantage of, which sometimes happens for sure. Um, and, you know, there's a line at which learning on the job is maybe not the only thing that you're after anymore. But early on, I do think there is value to being in a room full of professionals and absorbing what they're able to do and how they do it. Um, and as I say, oftentimes, uh, interns here will end up with some kind of further with some kind of extension with pay, like an actual job after they've done that. So here it's everything, uh, short answer, Vicki, they end up doing basically what any chase producer would do. That's good to know for, for our students who might be looking for, you know, internships or how to kind of break into, to the field. Um, we had a question come in that says, has the COVID-19 pandemic changed the way you do your job? Or do you see potential changes for radio in general moving forward? I think there are some, for some people, it's been maybe not that big a deal. Like our producers can call guests from home. That's, they don't need to be in an office. Uh, however, it sucks for obvious reasons. For one, I'm usually for, you know, I'm supposed to be in a studio with Carol. We're supposed to be able to look at each other. I am supposed to be able to look through the glass and see the technician and the director. I can talk to them usually and say what's coming up. We can have conversations. That's all. I can't do that now. I'm alone in this studio. Um, and I, you know, have to, I can't talk to anybody. I can only chat with them over the um, messaging system. The office is empty, which I mean, there's a, a, the energy generated by a group of people who are all trying to get a 90 minute show on the air every day or whatever you're doing in radio. That as everybody knows, and as I'm sure you're experiencing in classes, that energy, once it's lost, it's a, the, the feeling of loss there is when you think about it is enormous and it's, it's um, discouraging. Um, this is a group. We, meet every day we're supposed to meet in a room over there with ugly white couches where we sit around and tell jokes it's the only time we're all in the same room talking about what the show's going to be every day we haven't done that we've done that over the phone obviously for the past year um whenever there's a guest host in here my technician comes in afterwards and says yeah we you know we changed the this mic sock and we wiped everything down it's you know it's alienating we're all alienated we're all kind of estranged from each other i do wonder whether it will in the end i mean this is a giant building that i work in and i think a lot of people in this business 
across the country work in large buildings, I worry that some of this working remotely will mean that they, you know, they shrink their spaces and they have people work remotely. It's just not the same. Um, so there may well be long-term changes from this. Um, and this building usually has a couple thousand people in it, several thousand, I don't know how many, but um, I haven't seen more than like a three other people in any given day, except for the people that as it happens. So it's, uh, it's a huge change. It's, I was just talking to Peter Armstrong, who's hosting tonight, and he was saying it must be, I, I can't remember if he called it lonely. That's what I heard. It must be lonely in there. It is lonely in here. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a big, it's an unnecessarily big room that only I am in. So um, hopefully once, well, I don't know, hopefully, you know, right? Yeah, it's a tough question um, to answer about, you know, how we think things are going to evolve. Uh, moving forward but you know I think we're all kind of feeling those similar feelings as well um, our students and you know everyone who's working yeah. at, at Mohawk kind of has that those same feelings so we definitely appreciate you kind of joining us today and um, sharing some of, of your thoughts um, just to wrap up we, we have one last question and it asked um, did you have someone to kind of guide you or like a mentor when you first started out at CBC? They do that now there. It's much better than it was again when I started. Um, so yeah, if you were to come here now that you will be, assigned, if you were to come to, as it happens, you will be assigned a mentor. And we have some really phenomenal producers who are also very good at that. Um, I didn't exactly, it was kind of, um, I'm not going to say sink or swim, but it was a different, it was a different, I mean, you hear about this from, you know, decades ago when they'll tell you, oh, it was really different and everybody was drunk and you smoked at your desk and um, various other uh, stories that I won't tell here. But uh, so there has been a lot of progress in that area. Um, I think the important thing is that you would have a mentor now um, and you don't just get, because it was a problem. A 90 minute daily show is a lot of work to do. And so I think the idea was, you know, sit over there, hopefully you can contribute, but nobody has time to help you. Um, and that's not the case anymore. So that's a huge change and, a, and an enormous improvement from when I started. Um, I did, uh, there was one, I only had one other thing here, Vicky. I didn't really answer the question about our favorite interview. Um, which if you get a chance to hear it, at one point uh, on our 50th anniversary, which was two, three years ago now, um, somebody did like a list, I think they call them listicles, uh, of the weirdest interviews that we had run on the show. And it so happened that the, we've done like literally thousands, if not millions of stories over the years. And we've done, uh, we've done every horrifying and soul crushing um, but deeply important news story possible. And yet the number one interview that everyone always asks us about, this is not my favorite, but is one that we didn't even air originally because it was with Barbara Frum, who called a farmer who had apparently grown a huge cabbage. You can hear it. You can find all this stuff on the weirdest, if you just look up weirdest as it happens or something. And uh, he was hard of hearing. Like he couldn't, and the connection was not good. And it was suggested that maybe he'd been to the pub. But regardless, uh, there was no conversation going on. Barbara was like, how big is the cabbage? And you go like, what? Like he was uh, a Yorkshire farmer with a thick act. Everything about it was not going to work. And he could not hear anything she asked to the point where she said, what did you feed the cabbage? And he's like, oh, okay, sorry. And uh, culminating in here going, what did you feed the goddamn cabbage? Um, that, out of all of the interviews we've ever done, is far and away the most requested one. Uh, but the, the best one, to my mind, is one where this family uh, gave their chicken mouth to mouth to bring it back to life. It, they found it upside down, or face down, upside down, what would that be? Face down in a puddle. And um, they were this amazing, southern family 
And they just passed the phone around because more story kept emerging. So, well, I, and I said, you know, whatever, like Zeke, the chicken's in the puddle. And then Zeke came over and gave it mouth to mouth. And then a, his a sister or something chimed in with like, and at the time I was on the porch reading the Bible and I was just reading the story of Lazarus. So they immediately called this chicken Lazarus. But I mean, it was this phenomenal. It, it's And it wasn't even one of our regular hosts who did it. It just... If you were sitting listening to it happen every minute, something weird and new would happen that would make you go, What? Like to the point where by the end, it, it's just, it, and that was real again, critical thinking skills. But every, every aspect, every second of that was real. Um, okay. I That's too funny. That. I, um, I posted the link in the chat to. Um, oh, good. Thank you. Yes. Yes. The uh, top 10 weirdest as it happens stories of all time. Um, and that's actually the first one that comes up called Saving Boo Boo. Yeah, I, I noticed that the other night. <laughs> yes. Um, one of our participants said, you must have so many good party stories from all of your, your experiences and interviews. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the only problem is that your short-term memory goes. Like, you, I no longer know whether we did a story yesterday or two weeks ago. Like, I couldn't tell you what stories we've covered this week, but yes. Once somebody gets started, it tends to start a domino effect where, yeah, yes, yeah, very much so. Awesome. Well, I want to wrap it, wrap things up and um, thank you so much, Chris, for, for joining us today and for sharing your experiences um, and all of your insights and stories. Um, really hope that some of our students can benefit um, from some of, your, some of your advice and, um, it's just nice to have some of those funny moments in our day as well. So we appreciate you joining us today and taking time out of your very busy schedule as well. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you, everyone who's joined us today. Um, we hope to see you for some of our future success spotlights. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks. Bye.